our audience out there. Hello, hello. Thank you. Let's give our online audience a shout out. Over the pandemic, Fury Star had to pivot as we all did. And we started doing our reading series online. And we gained all these amazing followers who were like, just because y'all going back in person, don't mean you're going to forget about us, right? And we were like, no, we got you. So welcome to our online audience. Of course, welcome to all of you who came here tonight to the open micers. Let's give a round of applause to all of you. Our board member Paul Summers for this incredible venue. Yes, yes. Oh, duh. The amazing, incredible hostess with the mostest, El Renee. Center dedicated to black poetry here at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Y'all are lucky to have us. We're lucky to be here. And I want to give a shout out to Furious Flowers founding executive director, Dr. Joanne Gavin in the house. to introduce tonight's poet. Um, hold on, let me get, I, I wrote a whole thing, so I'm gonna read it. <laughs> In describing the poetry of Mervyn Taylor, Nobel laureate and fellow Caribbean poet, Derek Walcott pointed to the quiet quality and the subtlety of his voice. And though the Caribbean and our culture is, you know, in many ways loud and flamboyant, and with our carnival and steel pan, and though this vivacity is in Taylor's work, I too am drawn to the intimacy of it. Taylor's is a poetry that invites you to lean in and listen. They're quietly wise, quietly funny, quietly devastating. Like the best stories, the learning is in the spoken and in the silence. He's a poet of gesture and portraiture both, the language sketching into our mind's eyes extraordinary flashes that punctuate all of our ordinary lives, or the heroic nature of our ordinary existences. A 71-year-old cousin hoisting his 91-year-old mother on his back to bathe her from his palm both blind. The woman frustrated with the lockdown, pounding on her window screaming, virus be gone, from signs of the pandemic. For the poet's granddaughter, about to win her big race, her hair, no, her braid behind her like a bird in the current of air. I tell my students all the time, they can whoop whoop if this is true, that images are the bedrock of the poem. Is that true, students? <laughs> and the way Mervyn told Word is Born yesterday, he said, um, we make the word flesh. His work enacts this poetic labor with quiet diligence, bringing readers to, with him to verandas, beaches, Brooklyn, and Trinidad. It makes us admire or mourn people we met for the first time in his poem. In Taylor's work, we experience the poem as an exercise in openness and empathy. Full disclosure, Mervyn is from Trinidad and Tobago like me. <laughs> he also lives in Brooklyn, which is a city dear to my heart, the first place I lived after Trinidad. So a huge part of my admiration is the nod to the cultures, places, and characters of home in the poems. Mervyn is an avid masquerader, those are his own words, who participates in carnival culture, both in Brooklyn and Trinidad, producing with a colleague some of the winningest bands, um, full mass man. He's an artist who I think, kind of like in his poems, garters, gathers the ordinary and out of found items, cardboard, metal, wood, whatever, he makes art. He's a graduate of Howard University and Columbia University where he studied under poets like Sterling Brown, Derek Walcott, Joseph Brodsky. He's taught at several institutions, including the Bronx Community College, the Young Adult Learning Academy, the New School, and the New York City Public Schools which we were getting stories about earlier. And he was nominated Best Teacher several times. 
He's the author of eight collections of poetry, most recently, The Last Train and the Chapbook. Some of us just gained weight in the pandemic. He wrote a whole book. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Productivity just landed differently for most of us. <laughs> News of the Living. Please join me in giving a Harrisonburg, JMU, Furious Flower, and Golden Pony welcome to Mervyn Taylor. <laughs> to all those people who read in the open mic, a lot of you, the students that I met last night and this morning, just wonderful stuff. And I hope to be present when they give you your awards. <laughs> I start with a poem called Stutter Step. Somebody said you really can't see people when you appear, and you're quite right. <laughs> My father used to say, people in the island say it all the time, right? You can't hear me? Okay. No back door. My father used to say, he lived in the island and never once went to the beach. He said, Dad, come on, why can't you go to the beach with us? He said, because sea have no back door. <laughs> Stutter step. Old men don't stagger because they're drunk. Their legs just don't go where they want them to. They look distracted because they're thinking about some things they could have done differently. Old men are fools for wondering how they got here, when they started out for somewhere else, even had a map. They retrace their steps and stand at the crossroads looking this way and that. They almost get run over, not by young punks, but by other old men whose shirts are buttoned the wrong way, who slap away the wife's hand insisting they can do it themselves. They call a friend, and when he no longer answers, they cradle the phone quietly, emitting one of those long sighs that only a lover from the very distant past can hear. She who died in the back of a taxi cab or suddenly on a cruise somewhere out in the middle of the Atlantic when their song was playing. Old men do the stutter step, a kind of dance that comes naturally to them, a hesitation while the feet try to figure the next move. I told students in the workshop and this morning about an, an experience having not written for a long time and begging and begging the spirits to please send me a poem. And when this one came, four o'clock in the morning is the witching hour. And I wrote this poem out on post-its, st post big pile of them that I had to cipher through and finally get this out straight. It's called the center of the world. And this is a portrait of Brooklyn, right near Prospect Park, if you ever get there. It's the corner of Ocean Avenue and Parkside. I've been living there for too long. <laughs> From here, it's called the center of the world. You know, the strangest thing, I thought about this the other day. Do you know that wherever you are, each and every one of us, is the center of the world. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. you are the center, wherever you are. From here, I can see the world, all the people walking down Flatbush Avenue, going into stores, waiting at the bus stop, all the latecomers rushing into the subway, cut a corner from my window across Ocean Avenue, all the new immigrants in the winter wearing too much clothes. The police recruit from Long Island under the awning of the Arab grocer. Salam. I can hear the crack attic, the last of his kind disappearing between the floorboards. 
arguing with the Arab chief, the one with the scar on his left cheek, next door to whom the Asians scrape calluses from feet three times the size of their own, giving them the designs they want. Star, crescent, half moon, the flag of any country. I see all four seasons pass through the park. In winter, the lake shimmering between the trees. In autumn, the nervous leaves shaking and falling. The sudden flood of green in spring. In summer, oh summer, with the smoke of a hundred grills, the smell of barbecue, the birthday balloon sailing away from a crying boy, the slap of dominoes on the picnic tables, the relentless hawk, a rat dangling from its talons, dripping red onto the cyclist's jersey, the yellow paddle boats on their circular journey around the island that is the duck's breeding ground, dense and penetrable, the raccoon that scared us after the concert at the bandshell, the night brother sang his calypso blues, where a year ago Odetta made her last appearance, mm -hmm. half sitting under a falling moon, and the vet whose shock of white hair stood out among the runners, I don't hear his sidewise shout anymore. In the zoo, the enclosure where the bears ate a boy has a higher fence painted with pretty pictures. On Sundays, the drummers still form their circle, and in the evenings, horns announce the arrival of the Haitians, their sound atonal, harsh, unrelieved. They move in concentric circles, singing not words, but a series of O's, rising, falling, rising. Sometimes the midnight lines at the McDonald's are seven registers across. Here, a homeless man might sit nursing coffee, pretending to wait for the number 12. I know where it goes, out Linden, through dangerous parts of East New York. I take it almost to the end of the line, to a building that boasts a 13th floor and terraces with a great view of flights leaving Kennedy. I watch the Puerto Ricans on their day, the coquilles on the hat bands of the older men. On Fridays, the Jews stream in numbers towards the end of the park where the big synagogue is. The cops with their backs to them blocking traffic. I see all the time accidents at this five-way intersection. The elderly couple never making it to a wedding, their car spun round facing the opposite way. I catch on Labor Day, steel pans going down the middle of the avenue, a girl waving a mysterious flag, the sergeant longest on the beat saying, ah, don't worry about it, it's too long to explain what whining is. <laughs> I've heard relationships die at 3 a.m. among the pillars in the pavilion or at the stoplight when a car idled. I've heard the prettiest rendition of a Scott Walker song come up the fire escape and through my window through a long and sleepless night. I've heard shocking quarrels of people over a parking space, over love, over nothing. I've seen a boy gasp his last between the park benches after the pop pop turned out not to be fireworks, the cap on his head turning red. There are times I looked out to see not a soul, and times it seemed a congregation had gathered under my window, times when the heat would rise and then would not, my guest and I sleeping in gloves. I've lived through three supers. I've watched their sons grow to manhood. I've let the woman next door climb through my window when she'd forgotten her keys. I've stepped over the nodding ghosts of men acting like doormen in the lobby, their numbers dwindling till there was one, he who could hardly lift my suitcase. I leave, but I always come back here, where I review things from this vantage point. The confluence of people and lives after deliveries are dropped off early in the morning by trucks that come rambling through this intersection of the world. Lauren talked about um, news of the living and I was in Trinidad during the pandemic 
And people say, oh, you were stuck down there. I was not stuck down there. I was in the, the very room where my father passed away, in that house. News of the living. Where is Lita that I may greet and hug her, her arms, her face white with flour? She's been baking all day to help her son with the business. Is the shop flourishing? The autistic grandchild, is he doing well? I can't think whom else to inquire after except Dudley, who long ago retired into himself, drew the covers up to his chin as if he knew this day was coming. Ah, Lita, I know you're holding them all above water while the floodgates of this virus open all around us. You'll convert your house into boat, kitchen into galley, bed into raft, blowing into the sails until your air runs out, and then fanning with your apron, fanning. This is one of them that came to me while I was locked down, so to speak, in the very room, as I said, where my father passed away. It's called Spirit Animal. I don't know how many of you have seen, there was a movie about the Amazon where, where um, a lot of, the father lost his son among the tribes there, and it is said that um, all of us, each and every one of us, we have a spirit animal. The spot where I am now is where my dad died. I imagine it's his breath I smell, his scent, as if he were a wolf, and I've trapped him here. I race over my mother's steps, her fingers rummaging through places he might have left us a treasure, such a secret he kept while building this house, such a manly thing to do. I sniff the branches where his coat might have snagged, tall furs up against which he might have rubbed. Instinct has led me back to the night he breathed his last, to the image of him panting, because I want his struggle to have been a fierce fight, the hair on my own body to bristle, my howl so terrible it will be heard in the next village where they cannot sleep, wondering what my return means. I bury my head where his lapels would have been. I call his name Juju for his wolf to answer his sons tonight as the world hears and the world trembles. I told you I lived in this place for a long time, and so they came to remodel the kitchen and so on. And you know, I always say this about people who do hard work. The men who do hard work make us poets get out of the way, you know. <laughs> like they come to, t like when they're taking out the garbage out of the building, the super sun said, could you just move, you know. <laughs> like, we, just, we poets are just not very good, you know. They get out of the way. <laughs> Resistance. The workmen in my kitchen are tearing things apart. New cabinets, though I love the old country style ones, the scallop trim I painted two shades of blue. I hide out in the bedroom, the walls shaking as they pound and break wood that comes away with creaks and groans, nails human in their holding. Outside, it's a hot one. Protesters are on the move. I feel compelled to mention them, their bravery. Only yesterday I came across a picture in the paper of myself and students I'd encouraged to march down a street in the village. It might have been for Mumia. The headline's gone and I don't remember the cause exactly or what we were yelling. But now I'm thinking how nothing gives way without breakage, without some form of damage to the old the claw hammer in the hands of the workman, the nail 
powerless as he approaches. The battle for dignity rages in the nights and days, the homeless joining the campaign, the retired like me, hunkered down, taking notes, witnessing how there must be dissent and noise, the very floor coming up, the policeman's foot in mid-kick coming down. of warm snow and of course I don't have to explain what that means right it's the wish of every immigrant that snow pretty as it is should be warm Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this is a poem for an African tailor on Flatbush Avenue and these men are just incredible they come here and you wonder where they get their skills and so on. it's called status sheriff the African tailor on Flatbush wants to learn English he can speak it, but not write it. He's from Conakry, a word so wonderful I say it again, Conakry. I offer him slips on which to write the names of his customers so he does not mix up the clothes. When we converse, I find myself imitating his accent, asking him where he learned tailoring skills so remarkable. The space where he sews is like a cupboard. His four countrymen squeezed in behind him. We discuss our cultures and talk about these new immigration laws, how they affect so many. I have no idea what his status is. I only know that when I stand before the mirror, my old suit looks new, and that I would hide him in my house and feed him whatever kind of soup it is they love over there. <laughs> Or whatever kind of food. So, the next poem I'll read, I'll read something. This is from the new book from uh, The Last Train. And this is from my, my granddaughter, who is Zadie. And I think I'm going to beg everybody here who has any kind of influence at JMU to find a space for her <laughs> in, in the athletic program, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna call on you guys, you know, you've you got promises. <laughs> okay, so there she is, Zadie. It's called the Blur for Zadie. As a toddler, my granddaughter had trouble with balance wobbled along a ledge while her therapist held her hand. We lost every race we ran with her brother. Even with the head start he allowed us, trailed him into the building lobby, he and the super high-fiving each other. Now her dad's email says she came first in her high school 400 meter, third in the long jump. I'm showing everyone her video. Her long legs are blur as I rewind and point. That's her in the blue, no, the, the other blue. Her braid behind her like a bird in a current of air. Like the arm that once held her steady as she struggled to put one foot in front of the other. That foot now crossing the finish first. Yes. sign of staying calm while bullets whizzed overhead, a sign of the kindness of GIs as they passed out sticks of it to wide-eyed kids. In Minnesota, while a policeman kneeled on George Floyd's neck, one of the officers kept chewing as Floyd called to his deceased mother, 
that he was dying. And in Chicago, a black woman just out of the shower stood in the center of her living room, shivering, the broken front door letting in light, cups in a ring around her as she screamed, wrong house, you've got the wrong house. And though the sergeant used his jacket to try and cover her, she'll never forget their faces, especially the one who never stopped smiling and chewing, who never once looked away. I'm so sorry, this, this uh, town, for some reason, has my nose running all the time. <laughs> they tell me that it's, um, it's pollen or something. Yes. Yes. But it's, it's embarrassing, <laughs> to say the least. Right? Okay. So, I think I'm just going to read you two more forms. And, uh, it's done. oh. I always try to write something new whenever I have a reading, so this is actually for you guys. It's called Headed South. <laughs> At every state line we crossed getting here, I felt the bump. There was a yard with a dog that growled at us all the way. I had a bone I thought to throw, but it had rotted over the years. Once before, I got halfway here and turned around when DC lit up after Martin's death. And a buddy of mine robbed a drugstore and gave me a tube of toothpaste, so mad he was. I took it and ran back north, but no distance was enough. Since then, the crying goes on. The bridges sway as we cross them, buckling in the wind. Each time I felt the bump, I remembered an old lady in North Carolina who told me, never stand with your back to the road. She didn't say why, and I never asked. Just did as I was told. close with this one. This one I actually wrote as uh, part of a, a speech when my students were graduating. And it was sort of the by poem for them, but it's, it's for anything. It's called Remember. If we meet again after this on some street corner or in a marketplace in some foreign country, when the bombs have stopped dropping and you balance a beautiful baby in one hand and testing melons with the other if we stand there in the hubbub each staring and saying how much the other has changed or still looks the same if i don't remember your name as i introduce you to someone who has befriended me and stands patiently while we recall days when the world had gone crazy and you asked me who would save it, mm. remember I said, you will. Mm. Even if I leave, even if you never hear from me again, you'll find someone to tell your story mm. who will get word to the front that the war is over and the children can go back into the classroom now. Who will find me wherever I am, in the mountains or by the sea, waiting and listening for the quiet that will let us think. And when we walk from each other, you by way of the oranges, mm -hmm. me by the fish, my friend will look back and I'll remember your name. Thank you so much.
forward if you want to get a question asked. And also our online audience, you can you can send questions as well. We'll try to help you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so any questions? Questions from Mervyn? Students, this is your opportunity. <laughs> well, all right then. Oh, oh. I, I wanted. To, I love the poem, "The Sin of the World," ah. and I just, I just wanted to know what was the process there. You said you had, so you wrote notes on post-its, yeah. And then once you had the notes on the post-its. You just shuffled them around? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, like I said, I hadn't written in a long time, and it was an answer to a prayer almost, and it, it just came to me at four, in the morning. at four in the morning, it came to me, just said, if you're going to write, well, why don't you just start right where you are, you know, what can you see from your window? And I, I didn't want to take the chance to move from the bed to the desk, to the computer. So I just pulled the post-its and I started writing. I tried to keep them in order, right? But can you imagine that that's a long poem? There were a whole bunch of, of post-its. So by the time I got to the desk later on that morning, they were a bit scrambled, but of course I knew what I was saying. So I tried to cipher it out and figure what came next and what came next. And that led to that poem, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so Absolutely much, yeah, beautiful. thank you. We have a question online. It's, do you like using structure in your poems, or do you enjoy free verse? Well, I like structure, but I like the structure that the poem demands. The poem pretty much tells me how it wants to be. I, I don't start off saying, this is going to be this kind of poem. I'm not trying to write a gazelle or any of that stuff. I am simply letting the poem dictate to me the form it should take and pretty much if you have that kind, like I said before, poetry is like prayer, right? Uh, it's, it's almost sacred in its concept. So if you, if you let it sing the way it wants to sing, it will find its own way on the page. And if it doesn't, when you look at it tomorrow, it will shuffle itself and it will create its own form. That's how I feel about that. But mainly I find, you know, after a while you become a creature of habit, right? And so I find that the three-line verse, the third set, that has become almost like my go-to thing there almost all the time. But occasionally a different kind of poem will sneak in and say, not a break, just from start to finish and that's it, you know. But let the poems dictate where you have to go, I think. I'm curious about pandemic writing. Can you tell me about how you got to poems in the lockdown, in the pandemic, <laughs> in, the, in all of that? Because the poems are so beautiful and that time was so fraught. I just want to hear about that. Yeah, them. yeah. Um, a lot of the poems came, again, I don't know, three or four in the morning is a real bitching hour for me. So, and I was laying in the very room where my father, and I was very conscious of the fact that I was in the space where my parents, you know, where my father was and so on. So a lot of it came there, but a lot of those poems happened uh, in forays, going to the supermarket, things like that. I remember one in particular, there's one written with children involved. And I'm on the way to the supermarket in St. Anne's, as you know, and I'm, before I could get to the supermarket, I'm going by a yard and I hear these voices and their children playing in, in the yard behind a lot of shrubbery and so on. And I'm saying to myself, because if you remember during the pandemic, the, the streets were just airy, you know, empty. And or people, whoever was walking, everybody was furtive, you know, even in the supermarket, people don't come close to me, you know, you're getting the warning even before people approach. <laughs> But I heard these children, and they sounded so normal. In the middle of all that craziness, the children were laughing and they were playing in there. I couldn't see them, but I could hear what they were doing. And out of that, I knew a poem had to come out of that, you know. And I imagined what they would be doing then. And of course, they started playing kind of swashbuckling, you know, and so on, using the very plants that were around them. They made swords out of whatever. And I talked about that. But the poem ends that 
they used a big word, you know, and I don't remember what the word was exactly. Devastation. Devastation, yeah, thank you. They used a big word. They didn't know, but they'd heard all these adults around them talking about devastation. So they threw that in there, you know. Uh, um, so, and uh, of course, you have to bring other images to bear. And I, I thought, what would I compare these innocent children to? And there was a crazy guy in the supermarket uh, talking about, where are the sausages, you know, and yelling and doing crazy stuff. And I thought, how is, how compared him to these kids and so on. That's how that point sort of, maybe I could just read it. It's not long. Yes. 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 It's, it's not long. Mm -hmm. Bear with me, I'll find it. Yeah. It's called Day of the Virus. Behind a wall, small voices. Children play unseen in an overgrown garden, paving stones leading to a closed gate. They remind me that this curfew is temporary. They're safe from the madman who walks into the grocery shouting the things that are on his list. Bread, Vienna sausage his mother fixed before she passed. The wall around the garden is high. Their game is magical. Mother-in-law tongues for swords, lilies for hearts. They swash and buckle, have tea under an almond's broad leaves. Sheltered from the disease now plaguing the world, they sit using adult words like devastation. <laughs> many, many books, and there are many aspiring authors and published uh, authors here. I wondered if you might share your advice on how you put a poetry book together. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, the trick is to try to keep writing, right? Um, I mean, stop counting. Just mm -hmm. make, make use of everything that happens to you every day something you read in the newspaper, something you see in a movie, something you see as you step out the door, something you hear someone say, something in a movie, Any, anything and everything becomes grist for the mill, you know? And so you write and you find a way to combine those images and have them speak to you and finally resolve themselves in something. The toughest thing I think I had in, in my writing experience was endings. Yeah. And I remember Walker saying say to me, and I, I thought,